Okay, so turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 23. I'll read if you can just follow along. I am using ESV. The word of the Lord. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might. He worked this great might in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and he gave him as head over all things to the church. He gave Christ as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who is filling all in all. Wow, so, so powerful, so much information here. Let's go back up here and let's just start, slowly start to, to work through this passage. Just looking here at verse 15, I'm just gonna highlight, uh, when I'm, when, whenever I'm studying a passage, I, I look for the main, the main verb in, in a sentence. That, that's how I begin. And so uh, there isn't actually a main verb in verses 15. The main verb actually comes in verse 16. So I'm just going to highlight this, but we're, we're going to focus on verse 15. But let me just go ahead and, and highlight that main verb. So this is the main verb, and we'll come back to that. And as I look up here at verse 15 now, I see... I see several connecting words, relationship words. We'd call them conjunctions, okay? So I'll just highlight them really quick. This can be a conjunction. We'll just, we'll just put, a, we'll put a question mark for the time being. And then we have this, this dependent conjunction here. So I'm going to highlight it. If a sentence is, begins with a, a dependent uh, conjunction, or they would call it subordinate conjunction, we can identify that this is a clause within a clause. So in some way, this is going to modify this main idea. And, and the reason for the dependence is this, this dependent clause. Now, maybe that's deep, maybe, you know, so I, I don't want to go too much into grammar. At least you can recognize when you have, when you have conjunctions, especially dependent connection, conjunctions, they have to be connected in some way. So really quick, what is this relationship between these two? Okay. Um, uh, the clue to that relationship is this word because. And because often offers a reason, correct? Because identifies a reason. So Paul, what Paul is doing here is he's, he's giving a reason as to the, the, main, the main verb action. So this is the main verb action. He does not cease to give thanks. So positively, we could say, he continually gives thanks, right? And so Paul's providing the reason, correct? And, and that's further confirmed. Let me just erase this here. When we identify this, this is a prepositional phrase, right? This is also giving a, a, a reason in, in, the, in the sentence itself, right? So for this reason... For this reason, what's the reason? Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and uh, your love toward all the saints, I do not cease. Okay, so can everyone see now that that this is forming uh, two reasons for, for Paul giving thanks? And those two reasons are, number one, he's heard, uh, number one, about your faith. So he's heard about their faith. And the object of the faith is in 
the Lord Jesus. So really there's two objects here. The, 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 it's, the, the faith is specified, right? He's heard about their faith. So this is the first reason, reason number one. And then reason number two is he has also heard about your love and the object of the love is the, is the saints. So this is reason number two. This is reason number two. Let me, let me add two more things and let's, let's, let's react to this. Let's, let's consider this. Let's maybe think about some theological truths related to this, that this is teaching, or maybe it for, forms a, a foundation for this. Um, the other thing that I want to say before, as you're thinking about that, is that the actor, of course, here is, is Paul. Paul is thanking. Um, now, notice here, Paul is not, is not thanking the people. They're thanking, he's thanking, uh, who is the object of the giving thanks to? Who is the one receiving the thanksgiving? God, good, excellent, excellent. So, so we're going to get somewhere here in a minute. So the, the, the object of the, of the one that's uh, receiving, receiving is God, right? And that's, and that's correct. God is receiving the thanks. And the, and the, the indirect or the one that's, that, that's, that's the content with reference to is, is the, the believers, right? Is everyone tracking there with me? And in many ways, the reference is coming back to here, right? So why does Paul give thanks to God specifically? So we're asking the question, why? Why does Paul give thanks? And it's the, the, the saints and specifically their faith and love. Is everyone, is everyone tracking there with me what, what, what's being said? Now, what jumps out at you? It should jump out. It, this actually did not jump out at me at first. One of my friends, we, we did a Bible study together. We were leading a small group many years ago. So I did so maybe it was eight years ago, he made this observation and it was so profound. What kind of strikes it odd? Thinking about faith, love, giving thanks. What, what jumps out at you as seems off? What seems off to you about this statement of the reason for Paul giving thanks to, to God for the faith and the love of the, of the believers or the saints? What, what is a little bit odd? Anyone, anyone think about that? Anyone have a, have a comment they want to make? Okay, so let's, 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 make, one obs- let's make one observation here. That, that's a good observation, Mark. Number one, there is evidence of salvation. What that's saying is that that's good. Like we expect that, right? Um, what seems a little bit off at first? Who, who, who would we initially say, if we're talking about faith and love, who do you, who would we say like, oh, maybe, maybe in our sinful flesh, we would say who should receive the thanks is what I'm saying. Who should, who, who sometimes would we say, um, Paul, you should, you should be thanking someone else for these things. What does your flesh want to say? <laughs> what's, what's off the uh, it's like, it sounds to take credit for the, uh, for their faith. Yes. Yes. No, no, that that is it. That is it. We, we want the credit for our faith and love. Is that what you're saying, Ray? Yes. Yes. Does everyone see that here? Um, If we say that faith and love is coming from us, we can talk about Paul can thank God for their salvation, but it wouldn't be appropriate to thank God for our faith or our love. If this is coming from us. Does everyone see that here? It doesn't make sense. Um, unless the faith and love is not from us. <laughs> Does everyone see this here? If, if the faith and love is from God, then rightly Paul should be thanking God for their faith and their love. Does everyone see that? Does everyone see the connection there? Um, uh, even our faith, which we have to do, even our love, which, which, which is an outward evidence of our salvation, of, of, our, of, our, of our faith, as Mark rightly pointed out, 
the source of these things is God. These things are coming from God. So that rightly, Paul doesn't give thanks to the believers for their faith because it's not from them. The source is from God. I will not go there, but think about another passage that's very similar, hint, hint, chapter 2, chapter 2, 1 to 10. Maybe that will confirm. Maybe that will confirm some things. We'll, we'll get there next week. We'll get there next week. But at this point, I do want to stress this. The, the source... The source of our faith and love is God. Hence, Paul does not thank the believers for their faith or their love. He thanks God. And it's a, and it, and it's a, a continual, unceasing thanksgiving. Uh, one sidebar I just want to highlight here is that I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, a, a, this is an apologetic point, but it's very important. Someone who says, I believe in God, I believe in God, but their object of their faith is not Christ, that, 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 they're out. So, for example, apologetically speaking, Jews that have faith in God, in, 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 in the, the God of the Old Testament, but reject his Messiah, no salvation. They're not part of God's promises. So this would be a, a, an, an explicit example of... When I say AP, I'm referring to apologetics. This is, this is an explicit statement of the importance of our faith being um, the object being the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if someone claimed to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and not God the Father, they would be out as well. So, so it's not an either or, it's a both and, but here, but here the, the object is clearly the Lord Jesus Christ. So someone could not say, yes, I believe in God. Well, do you believe in the Christian God? Do you believe in, in Jesus Christ? No, I don't believe in. Okay, well then, you're not actually in. And the reason why I'm saying that is because many people will kind of waffle on this point. Well, well even our faith is a gift from God. <laughs> yes, where are you reading that from? <laughs> uh, the Book of Romans. Okay, yeah, no, that's true as well. It's true. It's also in the Book of Romans as well. Excellent point, Danny. Uh, so Tim, it is also interesting to note that uh, the word love there. Uh, yeah. There are very, very common, you know, notions that. Uh, the word agape love, like you know, we are so familiar with that. Yeah, uh, it's 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 very exclusive to God alone. But the, the, this one, uh, Paul also uses it for your love. That yeah. is, uh, he yeah he mentioned that uh, the love of the believers also towards yeah. Jesus Christ, and yeah. yeah, this is really interesting one. So so let's so let's 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 pick up on that. So so you picked up on the point of love to God. What, what command would be rooted in love toward all the saints, Sonny? What command would that be? Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, good, 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 good. So, so, you, have, so you have here um, the, the law of God is, is even present here, which is um, love God and number two, love others. And so um, the, there, I mean, there are two ways at it. For sure, Paul will say in Galatians 5, Galatians 5, faith, all that counts is faith working through love. So if we're looking at relationships here, like what, what, what so this is Galatians chapter 5. In this, in this reference here, uh, love is the evidence of faith, okay? And so we could, we could view that as Paul wants to see the evidence. They're saying that they're believing the evidence is the love for others. Fair enough. At the same yeah. time, you could say, if you're, if you're having faith in the Lord Jesus, you are loving God. Do you, you see that? Like to, to be clinging to, 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 to God in faith, the, the immediate necessary outworking, you can't, you, you, when you start to cling in faith, you almost immediately start to love. So, so you, you could you could see of it see of it like this, or probably this is also in the background as as well. Okay, my 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 thinking would be more in this in this view here, applying to here. But for sure, the idea of loving others is is present. And thanks thanks for highlighting that, Sonny. Yeah. Also, um, 
well, I'm, I'm bringing this certain because uh, here in the Philippines, we are so familiar with four, three kinds of love, as we're familiar, like filio, uh, filio love and, and, oh, and agape okay. love. And, and, and it's, it's very interesting that, that Paul uses the word agape here. It's a sacrificial. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, so, no, that's good. That's good. That's yeah, good. So okay, go ahead. Yeah. Here, here in, in, in our country, especially, um, you know, lexicon, we are, so for, we, we are um, going to lexicon and find the word agape and it's sacrificial love. And then um, some preachers before would say, well, agape love is only exclusive for God. And then you, may find, you, you will see here that even Apostle Paul used the word agape that the church has offered to loving neighbors or loving, loving one another, loving to the Lord. So uh, semantically speaking, uh, the word agape is also can, can be applied to human love. Uh, no, that I did not know that, Sonny. So that's a great practical, that's a unique contextual situation in the Philippines. So that's a great observation, more than just brotherly love. So that that's very insightful. Thank, thanks for drawing the attention to that. And um, yeah, uh, excellent, excellent observation. And so you can't get around agape only being applied to God. It's also applied to others. And I, I do believe that I do believe that 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 agape and also the, the Hebrew equivalent is used in the in the in the first and second commandment. I believe someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. Um, someone check me. Someone check me on that. Um, I think uh, Mark twelve. Mark twelve has the first and second great commandment. So Mark twelve, maybe thirty one. Someone check me and, and and double check us on that. And so look here now. So so number one. Paul gives this thanksgiving to God. And so huge point, huge point, thanksgiving to God for his work in the believer. So uh, maybe I'm going to write that down. I like that. Uh, I just, I just thought of it. This. So, and he'll come back to this as well, but I'm just going to write that down for my note for the future. Thanksgiving to God for God's work in the believers. Okay. And then let's move on here. So then he, then he has a, Really, you could say it, it's a deep, it's, it's, this is dependent here. So these two are piggybacking in some way. They're, 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 they're piggybacking. But really what I just saw is, is that the one is a thanksgiving and then the second is, they're connected. So the thanksgiving is being accented. But the, the second part is like an intercession and it's an intercessory prayer. So, um, so we could put here, there is this intercession, okay? Paul is going to intercede for the believers, okay? So uh, we could say one, and then this is, this is two. And in fairness, these are dependent, okay? It's, it's dependent on this main verb idea for those who are into grammar or Greek, Greek grammar. But um, so number one, he thanks, and then number two, he intercedes. So he is asking, he's going to ask God for something, okay? And so we actually find in verse 17, the content of the request. Okay, we see in verse 17, the content of the quest. What is the content of Paul's intercession for the saints? Any, anyone want to take a stab? What is the content? Well, what's the specific? Okay, what's the, what's the actor in verse 17? Someone give me the actor. Who is the actor? God. God. Okay, God is the actor. Through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So what's the action? What's the, what is the action? Give. Ah, give. And then what is being given? Wisdom and revelation. revelation. There's two objects here. God is he's requesting God to give them, to give the saints spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of him. What what in, in your context, TLH, TBC, Cebu, Cruciform Life Church, other churches not represented that I, I'm not not aren't coming to my mind. What would, what would we have thought? How, how do people often pray? How are your prayers in, in inter, interceding for uh, each other, praying for, for different prayer requests? What is the content of our intercession often? What is it? The real blessing I have. <laughs> oh my goodness. Blessing. What else? Yeah, Danny, you're giving the you're giving the, the scriptural answer here, but I want to know, I want to be, I want to get contextual, I want to get real, I want to get practical. What do we often pray for? Health, good health, protection, provision, 
vision, opportunities, wisdom, money. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, what would your pastor often pray for? This is across the board. So we're all guilty of this. I'm not poking anyone out. What, 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 is, what does your pastor often pray for? Um, or me right. first. <laughs> temporal, temporal needs. Eyes. <laughs> the spiritual eyes. But the spiritual eye may be okay. open. Yeah, See, okay. One lip is already <laughs> full of me. My goodness. No, so, so this is, uh, we're all guilty, okay? So I am guilty. We're all guilty. We pray for a blessing. We pray for health. We pray for our specific prayer request needs. We, we pray that our members would do what they're supposed to be doing, right? They're, they're out soul winning. They're out in small groups, right? It's, it's all do, 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 right? Do, do, do. We pray, for, we pray that the members would do. <laughs> Look at this. There's no doing. It's, it's like flipped. It's flipped. Spirit of wisdom and revelation of, in the knowledge of him. Wisdom refers to the application of knowledge. Revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, I went back and forth on this, and some people talk about it in being including like an intimate knowing of God. And, and in that sense, getting to know God more, I, I, I can agree with it. it. It shouldn't be praying for a personal relationship because they are already having faith in God. Is everyone tracking there with me? So I don't think the accent is upon a personal knowledge. Although going deeper in knowing God could be. The accent, though, is on knowledge about God and his will. Knowledge about God and his will. Okay. And we could say knowing him and going deeper. Okay. But think about that for a second. Paul doesn't pray. For them to be doing stuff, it's not that those things aren't important. It's I'm, I'm not saying that we should not be praying for these things. We should pray for these things. I pray for these things. But what is most fundamental? That's the question. What is most fundamental? For, for Paul, what is most fundamental for the believers is that God would give them the, the spirit of wisdom, the ability to apply knowledge in their lives. And what knowledge specifically? The knowledge specifically is knowledge about who God is and what is his will. May this forever change the whole debate concerning doing and knowing, theology and love, right? So people will say, you know, the, the, the doctrinal doctrine, right? We're all about doctrine here. Oh, we're all about love. You know, I even just saw recently saw a Facebook post. They were like poo-pooing theology and, you know, we need to love. Paul was praying for, uh, for okay. The prayer was the prayer is that we, that we. It's not we should pray for others, but we are praying. We are asking God to pray for ourselves that God yes. will open our inner self to His knowledge, to yes. His revelation, to His will. So it is we are asking God to change us, not asking God to change them. Yes. Um, no, excellent. So we are pr praying it for ourselves. So if I were to be praying this, I would pray it first to myself. I would also pray it for my family and I would pray it for my church. That's what we should be praying. It's, it's, it's focused at us individually and us corporately. We're going to see that in, 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 in a little bit. If not this week, for sure next week, this individual and corporate relationship here. So excellent job. Excellent job, Pastor Henry. Really good. So we're getting somewhere. We're getting somewhere, okay? Uh, the other thing I want us to see here is that we have this word revelation, revelation, and we might be tempted to think about, oh, God, give me a new revelation. Give me a new revelation, <laughs> okay? And that's not what Paul is referring to here. And the reason, how, the reason why we know that is that he is going to explain the revelation throughout Ephesians. So Paul is, Paul... Uh, through the Spirit is 
going to give it. And, and the prayer is that they would receive it, that, that God would give them the ability to receive it. And, we, and, and that, that turns us right to here. This, this idea here, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, this is uh, t- t- shi- uh, shine. This is shine here, shine light. And it's concerning your eyes of your heart. And so this is not, this is not intellectual per se. Of course, knowledge includes intellectual. Um, but this is, I want this idea of receiving. So think about this idea of receiving. We can teach all day. And if someone is not in that state, they will never receive it. So, so, so the prayer is that, that, is that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of God. Um, and the way he, 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 so this is actually a perfect tense, a perfect tense here, is that their eyes have to be opened first. Their eyes must be opened first before uh, God can give it to them. Is everyone tracking there with me? And, and the reason for the reason for the opening of the eyes preceding the giving is, is this perfect tense. It's, it's a past tense. It's a past action with present result, present effect. Okay, so let me write this down here. Past action with present effect. And this is and this is why this is why I'm saying this is not a random revelation that we're going to go pray for we're not, because uh, it's not some random revelation that no one knows. Okay, so how how can we be sure this is not a random revelation outside of the Word of God, outside of Paul's letter, outside of the New Testament? Because look at this, the key is know that you may know. This is the saints. The believers in Ephesus, and there's something that they need to know. This is a knowing, a knowing statement, and this here is a purpose clause. So, Jesus, what is the specific content of the knowledge of God? Number one. Number two. Number three. What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his, of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power? We need to understand the full significance of the hope that we have been given. We have to understand what are those riches of the inheritance that, he, that, that we have received, that we will receive. And we need to understand what is the immeasurable greatness of his po- power, okay? That's incredibly powerful. Looking here and continuing on with the sovereignty of God uh, theme, he has called you. So, some, some translations will just have the word calling, right? You're calling. I believe the text just says calling. I believe that the text just says calling. Um, But this is an appropriate translation. God calls us. We don't call on God. We don't call ourselves. Is everyone tracking there with that? Again, this is coming back. This is coming back and emphasizing the, the sovereignty of God in our salvation. Is there something in our spiritual lives that is not already awakened when we receive Christ? Yes. So let's think about that. So let's think about that then. According to this passage, how would you answer that? There must be, Diva, because Paul is praying. Paul is praying that God would give. Our eyes are open, but we don't have that full knowledge yet. Do you see what I'm saying? And so specifically, this is not this is not a question of your in or out of salvation. This is concerning this is concerning uh, promises here. We could say here this is concerning promises, right? And this is concerning God's 
actions. And this is, this is part of the sanctification process. Let me go to, let me go to later in Ephesians. I'm going to quote Paul now. Let's go to later in Ephesians. Let me just read you a passage. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught about Christ as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt with deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self that is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so there's clearly, although we are in Christ, we are not yet perfectly conformed to the image. And so there is this need for us to, 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 to act and to work in accordance with the spirit. And uh, look, look here. Um, uh, verse 11, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. So this is Ephesians 4.11. To equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. So uh, according to Ephesians 4, 11, we're on the way to mature manhood. But not, we have, we have, we're not there yet. Now, of course, my initial question was, is, is of course, uh, my question is, well, what is it? Well, what are the riches? Well, what is the measurable greatness, right? So that's our question, right? <laughs> what are those things? He's like, that you may know these things, but he doesn't spell it out. Where would we, where would we get the answer? Where would we get the answer to, this, to these three questions? Anyone? Thinking, her, I'm applying now hermeneutics to this process. Where do we find the answers to this? Anyone? I'm not saying I'm not saying give me specific answers. I'm saying generally, where would we look to find the answer? Ephesians, Ephesians one to three, right? So we're, we're drawing together our interpretative process. If we have a question, a deep question, where should we look? We could go to the commentaries, fair enough, but just read the rest of Ephesians and, and th these are going to be answered. The answer is in Ephesians one to three. What I'm saying here is 1, 20 to 3, 21. That's what I'm saying, if I'm going to be specific. What is to follow? What is to follow? This great power is toward us. I guess we could, let me just fix this here. The object of the great power is, this is the object, us. So there is incredible power incredible god's incredible power towards us how can we describe it what is it he's saying there's incredible power that's that's for our benefit how can we quantify it? what does it look like what does it look like verse 21 resurrection right yeah so that's where we're going what is this so then the the net the, the second half of this discussion here is Because we want assurance. You know, someone can say they're all powerful, they can do all these things, but it's only in your past actions that give assurance of, oh, this guy can do that or this. You know, I'm, you, do you see what I'm saying? So let's look here. We have an action here. He worked this great might in Christ Jesus. This great might, this, this example of the great might is in, is what he's done in Christ. This is an example of God's incredible power. So what is that? Number one, Ray said it, action one. God raised Christ from the dead. So God is promising us eternal life. What's the assurance? He raised Christ from the dead. So this is why people who deny the literal resurrection, they can't be a true believer. They're denying the very power that is our promise in the future. <laughs> Did you see that? There, if, you're, if you're just saying it's a story and it's just about a story power, 
No, there's, there, there's no assurance because either God rose Christ from the dead or didn't. And if he didn't, write, if he didn't literally raise Christ from the dead, what assurance do we have if he's promising us that we will be raised from the dead? It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And so action number one, he raised Christ from the dead. So we call the song resurrection power. That's the type of power that is toward us. So number one, we have resurrection power. What other power do we have? What other power does, I shouldn't say, what, what other power does he have? Number two, he raised him, he seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Think about that. So this is, this is, uh, this is, what kind of power is this? This is, uh, ascension, exaltation power. So not only can he raise us from the dead, he can bring us into his presence, right? And remember, the promise of the gospel is that the wrath is removed. We now have peace, right? So think about that. He seated Christ at the right hand. If he seated Christ at the right hand, he can seat us with him. You're going to see that later in Ephesians 2. Someone gets seated with Christ in the heavenly places. <laughs> Ephesians 2, look it up. It's, it's, it's incredibly powerful. Someone else is seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Ephesians 2. Next week, we'll look at that. So he's at his right head in the heavenly places. So this is location. One, this is the location clarification. To be clear, he's in the heavenly places. So this is already new creation language. New creation coming age language. Okay, now look at this, <laughs> a whole verse, a whole verse to, to emphasize how high he was lifted, right? <laughs> a whole verse, look at this, far above, location clarification number two, far above, no, what? Number one, rule. All rule, all authority, all power, all dominion above every name that is named in this age and the coming one. <laughs> so it's like, he can raise Christ from the dead, but if he's still under human power, if he's still under angelic power, what is that? This is to emphasize one thing. You can say, well, what's all the details? Like, let's, let's study each one of these words, and we can do that. And there's application in each one. You can look at there's, there's physical rulers. There's, there's systems included here. There's angelic beings in some of these languages here, uh, every name. But the whole point is this, brothers, the whole point is this. Christ is ruler of creation. Okay, I think this doxology or this prayer, this is the expounded mystery of God's will in Christ, which is in verse 9. Ha! That's a good one. No, this is, yeah. So this is expanding upon verse verse, verse 9. Let me just, let me take a pick. Let me take a peek here. Verse 9. Let me just go here for a little bit. Uh, verse 9, making known to us the mystery of his will. This mystery, which is here hidden, and in verse, here in verse, uh, having that, verse 9. Uh, verse, uh, verse 17, this doxology, this prayer, 
this is the revelation of that mystery. And in verse 10, this uh, verse 10, uh, verse 21, verse 21 is the answer is a continuation of verse 10. Yeah. Or an explanation from verse 10 or a continuation yeah. from verse 10. No, it's it's no, you're 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 right. It's it's a further explanation. And look at the climax, Henry. You're dead, you're dead on. Verse 10 has a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Verse 23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. <laughs> Do you see that? It's right, it's there. It's 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 really unpacking the plan of God. And and the making known, verse 9, making known is also connected with. Knowledge, excellent connection, really good connection, Henry. Excellent. I'm, that's thank you. That's really good. So it's this is really expanding upon verses one, three to fourteen, and then he's going to just further expound upon it the rest of chapter one, two, and three. Excellent. Yeah, sir Tim. Go ahead. Yeah, in terms of of the ruling of Christ. I could see that uh, this is the the somewhat culmination of the chapter chapter one, right? And I could see that the the reign of Christ, okay, the reign of Christ is not is not really happening in a not only happening in in, in the distant future, but it's it's already it's already happening right after his exaltation because Paul also mentioned the resurrection there. After yeah. he was raised from the dead, and also the, the first, I would say the first coming of Christ, and the second coming of Christ, because he also mentioned that not of this age, but also to the age to come. Yeah. So, yeah. so basically, now, now this is now a theological um, uh, concept here. Uh, the it seems that Apostle Paul was teaching us that that the church now is reigning with Christ. We are now victorious in this present age, as we. As we have the, you know, we, we already experiencing the 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 kingdom of God, yeah, and the expansion of the gospel throughout the throughout the world, and yet what, the, the the consummation of it is not yet happening. It, it would happen yeah. in the future. So there is a sense of the already and not yet language here. So basically, Christ is now reigning with the church, uh, already reigning in the church, but not yet fully rain which will happen in the next one yeah so so already not yet now here it's you have this age and then this one in the it's literally literally the coming one the the, the coming age and this is present tense so talking about already not yet um uh you you would see it in this more in this language here because it's already it's not will come. It's, it's coming into the present. Are you, are you tracking there with me? So this is more, this is, uh, this is where you would see, you would see that the already not yet. So um, it's coming into the present. Excellent comment. I'm going to come back to what you're saying. Jesus has a question that let me, let me come back to what you're saying. Uh, yeah. um, uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, sir, could we uh, in this uh, this uh, verses well, could we use this one as an uh, evidence or evidence for the divinity of Christ? The, the place that we could use it for the divinity of Christ is here. Okay. Seated him at the right, the right hand in the heavenly places. This is actually an allusion to Psalm one ten. So let me just quickly read Psalm 110 for everyone. I won't put it on the screen. We don't have time for that. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your holy, your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of mourning to the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever after the order of melchizedek the lord is at your right hand he will shatter the kings on the day of wrath he will execute judgment among the nations filling them with corpses he will shadow shatter chiefs over the wide earth he will drink the brook okay so so clearly th there's a description of this is a messianic psalm okay and so now it's debated 
but but here there would be this eternal priesthood, this 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 kingship. What, what Sonny's talking about 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 the prophecy of 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 reigning, sitting at the right hand. Um, Jesus uses it to say that he is greater than David. He's greater than David. You buy when he's debating with 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 the chiefs. But what I want to get at is Psalm Psalms one ten is connected with Psalm two. Now this is they're quoting each other and building off of each other. Uh, um, uh, hey, Sue. So maybe maybe you wouldn't see it. Maybe it's not a strong case. Let me quote Psalm two for you. Psalm two, for, Psalm two explicitly describes the Messiah as, as, God, as the Lord himself. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who have faith in him. So what I'm trying to get at, Sonny, is that be, the only reason why I'm saying that I, I'm, I'm, I'm quoting all of these different, they're all connected, they're all intertwined. But because if you're just looking at this passage here for divinity of Christ, what, what people would say is, yeah, he's just a man that God is highly exalted above everyone else. And there's nothing explicit in here that describes Christ as God. Are, are you tracking there? Now, now, we would say, of course, him sitting at the right hand, like that's, that's a godly function. And, and GKB will talk about that. But what I'm trying to get at is that people won't accept that as an argument. So if, if you're looking at really strong language, I would, I would make the connection of the quotation cited, uh, seated him at his right hand, connected with Psalm 110 and, and Psalm 2. And, and then you have a very strong case that the Messiah is in fact God. Yeah. So excellent question. So you could defend, you could defend divinity of Christ here, but what's being accented here is him as this is, we could also, what's being accented here is Christ as Christ as Messiah and um, last Adam. So I'm, I'm sure Sonny is going to like that. Last Adam. Final Adam. Okay. And there is this already not yet as Sonny, as Sonny was saying. Um, but coming back to, what's, what, to what Sonny was saying, the, the, the already being that Christ is already the ruler of the universe. And so this is what this is saying here. And so what is, uh, what is the parallel passage to this that's from Matthew that really describes in a very clear way what Paul has stated long, uh, lengthy? What is the, the famous passage in Matthew that unequivocally declares Jesus as Lord? It should be pastors that love discipleship. That's the Matthew, passage. 20, Matthew 28. Ah, Matthew 28, 18. Can you read it, Sonny? All the authority was given to me. Where? See, I'm just quoting it from oh, my mind. Oh, Let me read. Okay, okay, yeah, 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 sorry. All authority <laughs> is given uh, to me in heaven and on earth. In heaven and on earth. So that's that's the, the, the critical component, that, that Christ has lordship over all things. The, the, the eternal kingdom is now in a, has now been turned over to the Son, and he's reigning over, over, over the world. So we have right now action one, action two. We got a third action here. Action number three. He put all things under his feet. So where is this a quotation from? This is, a, this is actually not original to Paul. It's in Psalm 8, Psalm 6. Go ahead. Go ahead. Read it for me. Psalm 8, verse 6. It says, you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Psalm 8 is, is a psalm that describes the creation and commissioning of Adam and as dominion, as the Lord, as, as, uh, as the Lord over his created order. Now we're seeing this being fulfilled in, in Christ as the last Adam. So again, there's this, Last Adam, new creation motif that Sonny had alluded, had uh, nicely brought up last week. And so here we have this explicitly that Christ is now fulfilling this. And what's amazing is that, is that Christ is fulfilling this. Uh, and his church. 
So we are, because we're in union with him, we are also part of this mandate. We also reign with Christ. And we're going to see that in a moment. Okay. And so, but the accent right now is on the Lordship of Jesus here. Okay. Uh, so this is the third action. So not only has he put him in the heavenly places, not only has he raised him from the dead, and of course he could be above those, 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 um, those lords, those kings, those kingdoms, those beings, but in fact, he's put things under his feet. Okay. Now Hebrews will say there's not, it hasn't been fully completed. So you could also see already not yet here. They are already under his feet, but not fully yet. Okay. And so Hebrews two is going to highlight that, that there's, and, and we see that today, right? Not everyone, everything has fully been subjected, but we can say comprehensively, Christ can do whatever he wants in a moment. He has the authority to, to destroy and, and, and to do whatever he wants in all of created, all, all of his creation. So that's the third action, describing the power of God. So God has the power to raise from the dead. He has the power to exalt Christ to the heavenly places at his right hand, put him on his throne. And he has the power. He's putting all things under his feet. So powerful. I cannot emphasize this. This is the great power that's being worked in us. The, the, the phrase under his feet, it's a descriptive kind of leadership that he will be a tyrant or something. <laughs> like putting people under your feet, something like that. How how that how is it defined in a biblical sense? Thing? I'm gonna quote. I'm gonna quote for you. I'm gonna. And during his return, team, is there going to be a bloodbath against people who does not follow him or obey him? So let me let me let. I'm gonna I'm gonna quote Psalm two. Okay, I'm gonna quote Psalm two for us. I, I don't want to, I can answer that, Ray, but I think it, it's it, it, to, to have to have the word of God answer that because it is a hard, it's, it's hard, it's hard for us to see. And so it's much better if the word of God speaks to us than myself. So Psalm 2, I, I've already quoted Psalm 2. There's a connection there, but let me read this again. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, his Christ, his anointed one, saying, let us burst their, bond, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree, the Messiah says. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you are destroyed along the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Blessed are all who trust in him. And so what I want to say, Ray, is that Jesus is a long-suffering, patient Lord in one sense. In another sense, he is someone that we should tremble. He is someone that we should tremble to. And he will, he will, the, the description and revelation of his return is that he is going to, to tread in the wine press of his wrath. And so the image actually, this image here of under his feet is that of, of, of course, authority. But those who do not submit to his authority, the treading of grapes. in a press think about that imagery 
That that is that is in, that is insane that's imagery. Fun. They're walking around just squashing the grapes, and then the grapes. That's the imagery of wow. when Christ returns. That is that is grotesque. That should terrify us. It's gory. It's, uh, it's very gory. Right. Right. Yeah, the wrath of God, and so putting under the feet. It's like I I say this to my child, like. The bugs are under our feet. You squash a bug with your feet, right? It's instantaneous death. Um, and so that's the imagery here. All things are under his feet. And, and this is not, he's not squashing neutral, innocent people that love him. He's, he's squashing rebels that are giving God the finger. They're saying, we don't want to rule. We're going to burst your bonds apart. We will cast them asunder. And then he just laughs, you fools, I will destroy you in a moment. That's, that's the imagery here. Fourth, number four, he gave him as head over all things to the church. So he is the head. So I want us to see this here, okay? So the Lord God, so this is God here, gave Christ as head over all things. So God gives Christ to the church. So think about this for a second. Look at the relationship then between the church and all things. So this is a, we're, maybe we're not supposed to draw images, but you have the head, you have the body. This is Christ. This is his church, and all things are under the feet, right? All things. That's kind of the imagery that's being drawn here, Diba. Everyone's agree with it, right? It's a weak diagram. So does the church, does Christ only have authority in areas of spirituality? Uh, no, it's both physical and spiritual. In, in the church, which is Christ's bride, he, uh, the church is also uh, has given the authority by Christ to work for his mission. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So let's go there for in a second. Okay, Henry, let's go back to what Ray said and then we'll come right, we'll, we'll come right to the mission of the church. But what we want to look at right now is authority is, is spiritual and physical. So separation of church and state is not, is not accurate, biblically speaking, okay? And the, the separation of church and state, especially as formed in the U.S., it was to protect the church from the state. But the church should influence the state. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So, so we're losing that in the U.S., but think about the rules and, and laws that have been influenced, murder, theft, adultery. In the U.S., no more, but I think still in the Philippines, you can be punished for adultery, Diba. Abortion. The church, the church has authority in all areas because Christ is over all things. And so people want to say, I don't want to be involved in politics. And I get it. I mean, it, pol politics is delicado in different areas. And, and, and I'm not... I'm not saying that you have to be involved. And, 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 and um, but what I'm trying to say is that is that to just simply say, I don't want to be involved in my political duties of, of voting or, or being involved in civic duties. You know, obviously politics has a very bad connotation. Depending where you are, it could get you killed. So I'm, I'm not I'm not dealing with those issues. What I'm saying is just philosophically being involved in civic duties, our civic duty, being in working in the government influencing the government, holding political office. If, if political office or those things are going to, are, you're going to compromise your faith, then, then don't be involved. But, but there is a place for the church to speak truth to governments, to institutions, to businesses, in neighborhoods, not just in spiritual matters, in all areas, because Christ is head over all things, and we are his body. The fullness of him who fills all in all. And so what is this question of 
fullness of him who fills all in all. And so Henry, Henry, he snuck, he sneak attacked me. It's this plan of God. It involves uniting all things. But what is this, like the nitty gritty fullness? This is the presence of God. The presence of God. Maybe I'll share a handout like, like I did with, um, with the handout on greeting with looking at other passages. But this idea of fullness of God in the Old Testament, God's glory filled the temple multiple times. In Isaiah, it says that the whole earth is full of his glory. And so this idea, the fullness of him who fills all in all, this is Christ, his presence permeating all things, filling all things. So this comes into the discussion here about the, about the, the physical and the spiritual, about all things in the church. Christ, Christ's presence, Christ's authority is, is filling all things. So we can't sit there and say, oh, it doesn't apply in education that's secular. It doesn't apply in the laboratory. The reason why we're in COVID possibly in, in this terrible crisis is because maybe, maybe Christ wasn't involved in the ethical decision making of the labs. <laughs> and so, and so this is the climax here is that is that God is filling all things. Uh, God gave, gave, so this is the, the physical presence, the physical presence of Christ as his body coming down here. And so this is maybe what we want to put here, number four, the filling of all things. The filling of all things type power. The filling of all things type power. Think about that. You would say, Tim, th this world is terrible right now. I get it. We're falling away. I get it. But think about how the church, it overtook Rome. Rome persecuted, and then one day Rome became Christian. We can have that type of revival again. The Philippines is considered a Christian nation. Now, of course, people say maybe it's not so Christian. The same thing with my country. America is considered a Christian nation. Maybe it's not as it could be. But think about the impact that Christ has had for 2,000 years. Think about that. That type of power changing the world is the power that lives, that works, that is, that is focused upon us. That is focused upon us. Okay, let, let us... Um, I want to say one thing, and we're going to go to our, our breakout groups for, for 20 minutes, and we'll be done at 9. I want, to, I want to say one thing. Major point. Major point. I'll bring it up on the screen here. Major point. Here. So uh, these, these are handouts that I, I've been making, so I hope that you've received the first two handouts. Here's the third handout. Major point. Not only tonight, not only did the Father plan our salvation, uh, uh, Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. He had planned our salvation. But also, he acted in Christ to make it a reality through his incredible power. Raised him. Exalted him. Put all things under his feet. And he's filling all things through the church. Come on, my brothers. That's the kind of of power that I'm talking about tonight. What assurances of our salvation were in this passage? Can anyone give to me what were some of the assurances? So we're, we're going to focus on group number, th uh, question number three. What assurances did you find in this passage? What what was one or two of those, Jesus? Uh, that uh, there's uh, that guy is working in Christ. Then he raised uh, him uh, from the dead. Then uh, uh, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, and Christ will eventually will rule uh, and have dominion to the age 
uh, to the age to come something like that so. yeah so but so we'd want to say though the raining is present diba right? Mm -hmm. That was that was the accent that Hen, that Sonny rightly brought out the, the reigning of Christ, yeah, reigning of Christ, and then also the good. Okay, great. Um, what other assurances? Were there any other assurances that you saw in this passage? What other assurances? So that's one really big emphasis. But were there any other assurances? Uh, it's in verse. It's in verse eighteen. Okay. Uh, having the eyes of your hand, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Ah, so uh, calling, diba right? calling. If 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 God calls the whole world, there's no assurance there, diba right? because so many people have not listened. But if in fact uh, later we can discuss this some other time, but the effectual calling when God calls the going back to Ephesians 1 3 to 14. God has predetermined, He chose according to His grace, and then we believe. You see, so there's incredible assurance if God is calling because He's also chosen in Christ. So then let's just include this here this, this phrase in Christ is, is the assurance as well. Um, any other assurances here? I'm sure there has to be more. Verse 23. Okay, what is that? Uh, part of verse 22, part B. Now all things over all the church, which is his body. So, so the assurance is we the church is Christ's body. So definitely, definitely there is assurance. Yeah, and actually. I, I, I apologize for this because I did not discuss this in detail, but the, the, head, the head and body, this is union. And if we're part of the body, there's incredible assurance. Like you're saying, it's, you're, you're, you're in the body. This also speaks to those that will say, I am a member of Christ's body but I don't attend any church. <laughs> it's a severed limb. How long will a severed limb last? One minute? You have to put it on ice, Diva. <laughs> Life support. <laughs> so those are three assurances. Any more assurances? There are more assurances here. Come on. Give me one more. We'll, we'll end on this point. What other assurances? Do, do There are more assurances here. Yeah, so that's really connected with... So verse 22, so, so that... Um, Okay, so I can see what you're saying. So Christ as head and, um, and we, are, we are body. So uh, I guess there's, a th there's, there's assurance in, uh, lordship, in his lordship, right? So he is over all things, meaning to say that he protects. He can protect us because he is over all things. Is, is, is that kind of what you're saying, Claudio? Yeah, protection. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good. Okay, excellent. And and I, I, there's really that connection with 23. We are the body. He is the head. But then, of course, being the head, he is the lordship is over all things. Anyone else? 19, uh, Pastor. Go ahead. Verse 19. Uh, Go ahead. Immeasurable, immeasurable greatness of power coming from God. But you got to finish it. You got to finish it. What's the end? For those who believe, believe. Oh, yeah. ah, toward us who believe, toward us who believe. So, uh, excellent. There's more. What else? What other assurances do we have? The assurance is in verse, uh, it's also connected. Verse 19 is also connected to 20. 20. In okay. That power, that power, that uh, that power, the, power. the Father worked in Christ, raising Him from the dead, is also the same power that He will bring us. Raise us from the dead. So there's that connection there. The assurance is not only in the power, but the power that is at work now. Excellent. Excellent. 
Power of resurrection, I, I think, Pastor Hendry is one to yeah. accentuate that. Power of resurrection, that we, yep, excellent. And, and coming down here, F, filling all, filling all, the presence of God. The presence of God is filling all. Think about, think about the, the, the assurance there. Nothing yes. escapes. Filling all. So, and so, brothers and sisters, um, what would be, what would be, if you were preaching this text, what would be your call to action? What would be the command that you would give? Thinking about the emphasis here, what would be, maybe I'm sh switching gears from assurances, what would be your main call, um, your main commands to the believers in the church? What would be some of your main commands? So now we're moving, this, this here, we're moving into homework here. So yeah, what would I will be ask, the, the emphasis? Go ahead, go ahead, Sonny. I will accentuate the, the rules of the church as part of the body of Christ. When the, when the head rules, also the body rules. So in that sense, the importance of missional um, a task of the church will be, will be you know, exhort the, the church to... Church, when, when our Lord Jesus Christ has reigned now, so we should reign by, by spreading the gospel to, to our neighbors and to all nations. I think I would accentuate that, that necessity. Okay. So, so Sonny, I don't disagree. I don't disagree with the content. That's great. And the implication is that. But in this passage, is the emphasis on us ruling is that the emphasis here in this passage? So here's my question. Is Paul's desire in this passage that we would rule and reign well with Christ? Is that, is that Paul's mm -hmm. desire? Are yeah. you sure? Yeah. What, what, what is the content of his prayer? <laughs> giving. The, the, so, so again, I, I, I want to I draw your attention. I'm not disagreeing that... In one sense, you're you're correct. I'm not disagreeing with the truth of the statement. I'm I may be pushing you a little bit on what the text is actually calling us to do. And what I want to say here is that this is this is a this is a um, uh, this is a true statement, but not being emphasized here. And so, what is Paul's specific prayer? The specific prayer, diba, it's that we would know. We would know. Three things, and and that and that God would give, would give wisdom and the revelation and knowledge, knowledge of Him. And, and so, look here. By implication, part of the content of knowledge then then moves towards this as an implication. Okay, so again, I don't misunderstand me. I, what you're saying, Sonny. We could even use that as application, but fundamentally, is the passage focused on doing or knowing? So this is like, yeah, this yeah. is I, I, I'm getting. I, so if we really focus on what the text, we will always preach biblical. Biblical. So what what I want to say is, there's always the balance between knowing and doing. doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And so here, the accent is on knowing. And so in some passages. Don't worry. When we get to Ephesians 4 to 6, we're going to be doing, we're going to be ruling and reigning. Okay, don't worry about that. There's spiritual warfare yeah. coming up. But this passage here, I hope that this is a, a, we can grab, this is preaching the whole counsel of God. In this passage, Paul's sole focus right now is don't worry about doing right now. You need to know these things. And so I would say, members of the church, you need to know these things. You need to know these three things. The hope of your calling, the, in, the, you the, the incredible riches of your inheritance, and the incredible power of God. Those three things you need to know. You can actually preach this in two sermons. That is, what, verses 15 to 19 can be sermon one. 20 to 23 can be sermon number number. Number two, and sermon number two is, you need to know, brothers and sisters, the great power that God has worked. So in this sermon, it's, it focuses upon knowing, and you can still use application, but, but Ephesians 1 to 3 focuses upon the knowledge, 
And so we pray, we pray that God would fill them with, fill us with a, with a spirit of wisdom and a knowledge of truth. Um, but this is, this comes down to some pastors were always focused on doing. Some people will always focus on knowing the text will always take us. You will have an excellent balance of both. You will have an excellent balance on both. And so, um, uh, let's close on this. I just really want to emphasize here that the text will guide us and we need to be so sensitive. We need to be so sensitive to, to what the text is calling us to do. All right. And I would definitely say here, if I was preaching, depending on how much time I could preach this in two sermons, I might actually preach this in two sermons, depending upon preaching schedule. Maybe, maybe you can only preach it in one, but ideally I would preach this in two sermons. Um, the prayer the intercession and thanksgiving, and then and then the first, then the second sermon would be the power worked in in Christ, and then brothers and sisters, Ephesians two one to ten, God's power worked in us. Come on, so then we're just working down the way. So 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 um, uh, I hope that you're seeing. I hope that you're seeing. Let let's go ahead and close in prayer. It's late. I hope that you've learned something. Work on those assignments. Doing these things practicing the breakout sessions, the reflection questions, and then getting to that homework, you're going to have these types of questions. And I really hope in no way was I trying to, to, to point anyone out. It's, it's something that I struggle with in the past. We need to become really sensitive to where the spirit is leading us in the word of God. And it's there. You see it. We all see it. And so it's there. We just need to be looking. Let's close in prayer. Father.